Okay, well, we saw a little bit of this this morning when Beck was talking, and um, I'm, I feel very excited about this session because I used to work on phylogenetics, but I haven't worked on it for a long, long time. Um, so I'm really excited about the new work that's coming out. But the funny thing is, we're still talking about the same old problems. So where the Angophora and Carimbia sit relative to eucalyptus? What are the subgenera and sections and stuff doing within eucalyptus? Um, what the hell is going on with the chloroplast and um, species phylogenies? That's all just the same old stuff, but at last we've got some better tools. So going back to that 1999 meeting, here are the taxonomists who were there. I don't really call myself a taxonomist, but I got lumped in there. Um, so Ian Brooker and Ken Hill were here, and sadly they are no longer in our community. Ian Brooker died in 2016, and Ken Hill died in 2010. But Pauline was going to be here, but unfortunately um, her husband Gareth Nelson is unwell, so she has stayed in Melbourne to be with him. Peter is more high-level stuff, Mertaceae, so this is a bit too intense for him. And then there are these two whippersnappers <laughs> who are here, and um, I'll talk about Dean later, but um, that's me, and there's another person you can't see in there. <laughs> so, yes, I was ready to drop by that stage. Okay, so... A very quick review of what's been going on. So Ken Hill has left a legacy. He pulled Carimbia and Blackella out of eucalyptus in 1995. And then Brooker, who was a, um, a classic taxonomist. So basically, a species is whatever a good taxonomist says it is, and don't argue, and none of this molecular mumbo-jumbo, it's rubbish. So he put Carimbia and Blackella... Hey! <laughs> He put Carimbia and Black Ella back into eucalyptus and then we took it out again <laughs> with our ITS. Now this ITS stuff was one of the largest molecular surveys ever done. We had all of 90 species in there and um, that was pretty neat. So I'm really excited about Mike Crisp's talk where he's got about a gazillion species and lots of samples and it's going to be really awesome. And Lynn's going to be really great because she's going to talk about the insects that have co-evolved with eucalyptus. So that's really exciting. And um, this, uh, this paper here is still kind of before the genomics revolution and I forgot to bring the little scroll, but basically Beck did this um, with an array, a data array, and she managed to squeeze in 540 samples. So she got this humongous phylogeny that took about 10 pages to print out. But um, yeah, so that's all I'm going to say. So I'm going to start with Mike Bailey, who's going to tell us about that overview sort of Carimbia, Angophora, Eucalyptus space. So thank you. You're right, too. Hang on. Seems to be going. Yep. Okay, well, thank you. So, so I'm going to start this session by giving a bit of an overview of where things are at with the eucalypt phylogenetics um, before I hand on to Mike and others with big data sets that um, take things a little bit further than, than what we've seen before. Um, just by way of introduction, so the, the tribe Eucalypti, in which the eucalypts belong, includes the three main genera that we're talking the most about at this conference, Eucalyptus carimbia and Angophora, and these rainforest relatives that are small genera um, with one or two species each. I'm just, I'll put in some pictures of these just because we're not likely to see them at any other stage. So it includes Aralastrum from New Caledonia, a monotypic genus. And what these guys do... Um, different from most of the other eucalypts is, um, apart from the Angophora, I guess, um, that they've got these flowers that have distinct sepals and petals and they don't have the, the percolate um, flowers. And the other three small rainforest genera are in the kind of wet tropics, the monsoonal top end, and through New Guinea and Indonesia. The main genera, um, and these are their distributions, and are uh, uh, Angophora, small number on the east coast, Carimbia, mostly northern, but some members in the southeast and southwest, and eucalyptus that's all over the place. 
Uh, in terms of these, these larger groups, Corimbia and Eucalyptus, they've got quite detailed infragenetic classifications within them, so mm, subgenera and sections and series. And within Eucalyptus, the three that I'll mention, because I'll just talk about them a bit later on, um, are the three largest, as we all know, Symphia myrtus, um, Eucalyptus and Eudesmia, and then a bunch of monotypic ones. And this is according to Dean Nicole's latest classification, which accords pretty well with the uh, phylogeny as we know it. So the phylogeny of Eucalypts, there's been... We've, people studying it for long periods of time. Um, here in Australia, we're obviously very interested in eucalypts, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why we might want to have a reasonably well-resolved phylogeny, and these are just some of them. Um, for the taxonomists, the fusty old taxonomists who want to classify everything into subgenera and sections and series, we want to place that on a tree. We want to get some kind of sense of the evolution of these things in space and time as well, and that's something that requires a relatively good understanding of relationships. Things like co-evolutionary studies that, that or uh, is the sort of thing that Lynn will talk about later on. Uh, a good phylogeny of the eucalypts is something that we need. In terms of how we've approached this, there's been an evolution of, of data sets. You know, from working with morphology um, in an explicit phylogenetic sense probably since the 1980s to various kinds of molecular data as new things have come along or been developed as a community, we've, we've thrown the tools that we've got at them. Um, for many years, as Dot said, that nuclear ribosomal DNA was the kind of workhorse that people used and bits of chloroplast genomes. Um, then we've had the evolution of the, the, the DART markers and you know, that's in the pre-genomic kind of um, genomic sequencing era and we're now starting to move into that and that's what Mike's going to take us to uh, with the next talk. So this is a kind of overview phylogeny, and I'm scared about putting this up because people are going to say that I've got some branches in the wrong place or quibble about these things. But this is kind of where I think we're at, more or less, at the moment. And that these that eucalyptopsis group, those three monotypic genera, clearly form a group that go together. I've connected them and Aralastrum to um, the other eucalypt genera in a polytomy at the base. A mic might show a tree. Have you got Aralastrum popping up in here somewhere in one of your trees? Yes. So even that's not entirely certain. Um, but most trees resolve Corymbia and Angophora together with Eucalyptus. We've got this argy-bargy between Corymbia and Angophora as to uh, since Corymbia got split out in 1995 by Hill and Johnson. Um, is Corymbia a single monophyletic lineage? And basically the data to date have been equivocal. And these are just examples of some various data sets that have been published, and some say it's a monophyletic group, uh, therefore, you know, good in terms of classification as a genus, others not. Um, and the jury's still, well, maybe Mike's going to settle it for us after the, in the next talk. Um, in terms of these other um, groups, they're the, each of the subgenera, these major subgenera, the large ones, is monophyletic and the smaller subgenera align with one or other of those. The exact nature of relationships between these jumps around uh, in various studies. Each of these uh, groups, and Corimbia as well, have been the subject of more detailed studies using various sets of taxa and markers, and these are just some of the recent studies. And don't get annoyed if I've left out your favourite study or something you worked on for years just because this is the last slide I made this morning. Um, <laughs> So, and so apart from these detailed studies of individual groups, you know, we owe a lot to the really comprehensive high-level studies um, that, like, well, all dots, um, and, and one that Mike and Andrew Thornhill and others have been involved with as well. That, that sample a large number of taxa for small numbers of markers, and what we're moving into is the era of, you know, large numbers of samples and taxa for large numbers of markers. Um, so what are some of the challenges that we faced along the way? So to date... That small data sets, sampling pretty small proportions of the genome, so it doesn't give us much phylogenetic signal, so it limits the confidence we can have in our conclusions. Uh, another major challenge that has been thrown up by, um, particularly using chloroplast markers, and the, the phenomenon probably doesn't just apply to chloroplast markers, but that's where it's come to the fore, uh, is that there's widespread incongruence between taxonomic groups at all, almost all levels in the phylogeny, but at least species and up to um, sections and, and series and subgenera in some cases, between the signal that we get from chloroplasts and that, that classification, um, suggesting that, that, you know, and this has got to do with integration, hybridisation and integration, which means that, you know, 
the, the evolution in the eucalypts is not always tree-like, and trying to depict a branching tree-like diagram is therefore a problematic thing. Um, so this phenomenon of incongruence between chloroplasts, phylogenetic signal, and taxonomy uh, is, has been shown in a range of groups in different subgenera, uh, both in subgenus eucalyptus and in subgenus symphiomyrtus. And I'm going to give just one example because I'm going to come back to it at the end and talk about it in a little bit more detail of this kind of thing. It's between these three species, uh, eucalyptus regnans, the mountain ash, messmate stringy bark, and alpine ash. All well, these are what we call them in Victoria. You know, different names for some of these in Tasmania. Um, and this is work that Paul Neville did uh, a few years ago when he was at Melbourne still. And he just used a very small number of chloroplast SSRs. And for these species, they've got color-coded kind of haplotypes, about 30 of them. It does, if you're in the central highlands of Victoria, it doesn't matter if you're a eucalyptus regnans, a eucalyptus deligatensis, or a eucalyptus obliqua. Most populations are fixed for the same chloroplast haplotype. Uh, the same is true in parts of central Tasmania. They're fixed for another haplotype, uh, this yellow haplotype in another part of Tasmania. And the fact that these, these shared haplotypes across species boundaries are geographically localised tells us that this is a signal of, of introgression that happens at a place rather than just being retention of ancestral lineages. So I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, so the question is well, clearly down at the tips and, and that this, this molecular data just echoes what we've known from you know, breeding studies and crossing studies for you know, long periods of time. Um, that if at the tips of the trees, if the, those species were all in subgenus eucalyptus, if they can hybridise, how deep does it go? Um, the genera are, are reproductively isolated from each other, and when we look within eucalyptus, these three main subgenera are reproductively isolated from each other, so you don't get that crossing of, um, of chloroplasts and other genetic material between them. Um, and then within large groups like the symphiomerts, the sections are vary in the degree of reproductive isolation from each other, from being not very reproductively isolated to quite so. Um, so what I'm going to say, so that's the situation in eucalyptus. I'm going to just post, talk about a little bit of information in Carimbia where the subgeneric boundaries are not quite as um, uh, reproductively isolated. And this is a study that was done by Tanya Schuster and a bunch of us published last year. So it's not totally new, but um, it's worth talking about. So it's about Carimbias. And there are two subgenera in Carimbia, for those that don't know. The, the red bloodwoods uh, that include a number of kind of subgroups and the uh, hey. um, and subgenus Blakella, which includes the ghost gums, spotted gums, yellow blood woods, and eucalyptus toroliana. Uh, eucalyptus was that a slip of a tongue? Carimbia. <laughs> um, these these subgenera. If you do a, a tree based on nuclear ribosomal DNA, um, you get in Carimbia you get two clades: one for subgenus Carimbia, and one for subgenus Blakella. And then within that group, those groups, the, the, mm, uh, the, um, the spotted gums and the ghost gums and all those things more or less come out as distinct groups as well, based on the colour coding. If you look at those taxa using the chloroplast, and what, what Tanya did as part of the study was assemble, so this is a small amount of data, 663 base pairs of the genome, you know, tiny. Um, this is still not much bigger, well, it's a bit bigger, um, about 120 KB of, of chloroplast data, you get a much, you get two main clades within Carimbia, um, but this clade here that's mostly the red bloodwoods covered in red has some of these ghost gums which were down here in the middle of it. Um, and this second clade here, um, through here, is a mixture of all of those subgenera here and it's got some red bloodwoods thrown in as well. Um, this we interpret as uh, evidence of, of hybridisation um, between these subgenera. And uh, the thing I'll point out also about this slide is that the position, position of Angophora in both of these trees is nested within Carimbia here, so it's closer to the red bloodwoods. Here it's closer to uh, these other, well, red bloodwoods and a mixture of other subgenera. But the supports, particularly in this tree, are pretty low. So there's no maximum likelihood bootstrap support and a little bit of parsimony support. Um, that crossing, so that kind of says the subgeneric boundaries in Carimbia are not, not as deep as they are in eucalyptus, I think is what it's telling us, or at least they're, 
the, that lack of reproductive isolation. And it goes hand in hand with what we've known in the past, and is Rod Griffin around? Yes. Um, from the, you know, studies that go back to Rod Griffin's time and before, the, the work that he's done on documenting hybrids, um, that these groups are all capable of, of hybridising. So what we're seeing is the molecular signal of that. What I want to move on to talking about, though, is the extent to which, when you see that there's this chloroplast integration, how much nuclear integration goes along with this. And this is important for a number of reasons. If you're interested in reconstructing phylogenies, um, it's something that will affect our ability to make these, these trees. And if we're interested in things like the capacity of these plants in terms of their genetic variation that they have to adapt to in the face of change. Um, gene flow between species is obviously an important source of genetic variation. So the extent to which that happens is something we want to know about. And there's been a number of studies that have looked at this. And I'm just going to talk about one study that we've done recently. And it's not a huge study, but it's among, uh, by this master student, Alice Crow, um, who did a lot of the work, and also Todd McClay, another student from our lab who's now at CSIRO in Canberra. Um, and it concerns these same three species we talked about before, Regnans, Obliqua, and Delegatensis. We've added a, a fourth one, Eucalyptus porciflora. Um, I'm going to skip over that. These, these things, typically, they will occur in the same sites, but as an altitudinal replacement series um, as you go up the hill. And the exact order of them will depend on the topography and, and conditions a little bit. You will sometimes have these two swapped around. But they'll, they'll occur in a, in a series. And they're species that differ in their bark, their um, adult leaves, their juvenile leaves, uh, their arrangement of their um, reproductive parts in inflorescences. There's a whole bunch of their good species. Um, and they're the ones that share those chloroplasts that we talked about before. What we did was sample them just at a small number of sites, at four sites in Victoria, and a small number of individuals in the data set I'm going to present today, just five per species per site, but it's enough to give a, a flavour. Um, we assembled two data sets. One was whole chloroplast genomes, and the other was a set of um, double digest RAD um, loci, so randomly across the, the genome in theory, that, that, to represent the nuclear genome. So the questions we had with this particular study uh, were, so we, we inferred this chloroplast sharing based on a very small number of SSRs. There are only four loci. So what happens when you look at whole chloroplast genomes? You've got 120 kb of sequences. Do these things, are they really sharing chloroplasts or are they you know, distinct at that kind of finer scale when you get more resolution? And the other question was, how does the pattern in the nuclear data compare with the chloroplast data? So when you build a tree, so this is just a, a maximum likelihood tree of the chloroplast data. And there are basically two geographic groups when we look at this. Um, and one, this clade over here corresponds to these two sites here, Mount Useful and Lake Mountain. And this grade through here, that's a number of clades, are these more eastern populations. So for starters, we see the, the pattern is you know, at least partly related to geography and not to the what species the the chloroplast came from, and when we map on the species and colour code it here, it's all over the place. Yep. So we see that even when we use these whole chloroplast genomes, um, that there is this kind of you know clear intermixing um, that's geographically localised that we can relate to integration. When we look at the nuclear data, so this is a structure plot based on these. 1,000 odd loci, and this is a fairly conservative data set that only included loci that were represented in more than 90% of the samples. And we, you know, when, as soon as you get into these data sets, there's all different ways you can treat them, but no matter what you do, you kind of get the same answer. Where, based on the morphological identity of the species, they pretty much come out with not a heap of signal of admixture. You know, some evidence here of a little bit of admixture between Eucalyptus obliqua and both Regnans and Delegatensis, but not much at all which is in really stark contrast to the, to the chloroplast data. Um, so what are the explanations of that? It could be that this integration happened a while ago and the chloroplast mutates slowly, and so we're only seeing uh, the signal of that, and it's kind of been washed out in the nuclear genome. That doesn't make sense, because some of these shared haplotypes 
or very similar haplotypes out of 120 KB might only be two base pairs different. You know, that's probably a fairly recent thing. Um, I guess my take on it is that there's probably strong selection um, for those particular uh, genotypes um, that conform to the, the traits of those species in those altitudinal series. Um, another thing that I haven't really thought about is the extent to which we typically think of this plastid introgression as being just a, a result of this kind of demographic processes. Um, but could there be selection acting in the other way that particular plastids or chloroplasts are, are adapted at a particular site? Um, and that's something that Antanas might talk about, or possibly not. He'll talk about adaptation in the chloroplast. OK, so I'm just going to finish up before I get booted off. Um, where do we go? So we've come 20 years since the last conference. There's some key parts of the phylogeny that we still haven't resolved even at higher level. Is Corymbia monophyletic or not? Maybe Mike will tell us. Um, what we need is a better sample of the nuclear genome, which is what we're on the cusp of. It's what we're about to hear all about. Um, we've got in the nuclear genomes of these organisms lots of low copy genes, which are potentially useful to us. And we've got a lack of recent polyploidy with all these plants having the same chromosome number, but we do have that kind of ancient polyploidy that you know, cr creates some gene clusters that we need to deal with. Um, we need, I think, to understand the biology of these things, studies that couple both the chloroplast and the nuclear are going to be valuable to understand um, that, that kind of level of integration of both markers. Um, but I think even with the new genomic data, things are likely to be really murky at low taxonomic levels where there's going to be signals of integration and incomplete lineage sorting and all of that kind of stuff that you find in all kinds of plant groups. And that's all I wanted to say. And thank you, everybody. And these are people that helped along the way. <laughs> So, so I no, we don't. Well, there are some assembled ones. I mean, so I think the, one of the problems is there's lots of structural rearrangements in the mitochondrion. So I've assembled little bits of genes here and there. And where's Joski? Yeah. So I mean, so we we've, we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah. But my gut feeling is that the, so the genes where what I've looked at there's not much signal in them. And so they're highly conserved and that the spacer bits, and when you, the gene order changes all over the place, then those you know, intergenic spaces are hard to find homo homologous bits to line up. So that's, that's my initial take on it. Oh, they were back. Yep. I was just thinking, you know, if that kind of catching looking across species, obviously you want good coverage and you want the species yes. to be yep. um, distinguish them. But does that possibly also bring you in personally to that really conserved one? Yeah, yeah, and so so it does get it does get a little bit more murky when you in, bring in more low side, but not dramatically. The signal is still that these things don't have. But uh, yeah, it's something that I think before we publish it, I want to muck around with those parameters a lot more just to make sure that we're not leading ourselves astray. Yeah. Yep. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. I'm really happy this meeting has, has come off and that so many people could make it. It's great. Okay, so uh, these are, I didn't put on my, my list of co-authors up here because really there are probably too many people who should be co-authors to name. They include many of these people. The key collaborators really are Justin Borovitz from ANU, Jasmine Jaynes who was a postdoc on this project and is now in Vancouver, on Vancouver Island, and Kevin who I've only got a terrible photo of here. So uh, we've heard a lot about hybridisation. I'm really glad to be speaking after a few of these guys because I don't need to introduce it very much. Um, and, but what we're doing really is using, um, is using whole genome sequencing. So I'll talk about four methods that we're using um, plus a little cautionary tale at the end if I have time. Is it? Uh, okay. So 
Uh, this is what most zoologists think of when they're thinking about hybridization, Lynn accepted. Um, you can see some of these things are real and some of them are not real. Um, <laughs> the, the, the ones that are real tend to be between more closely related species. So you don't see hybridization between dolphins and kangaroos, for example. It just wouldn't work. But that doesn't mean that in the history of dolphins and kangaroos there wasn't hybridization a long, long, long time ago when the ancestors were very closely related. And so that's one of the things that we're um, struggling with in eucalyptus because we've got not only the signatures of incomplete lineage sorting, of course, but also hybridization that, that probably goes back to a, quite a long way. OK, so enough pretty pictures. <laughs> More pretty pictures. So in eucalypts, we're, we're pretty special because we've been thinking about hybridization for much longer than most zoologists. Um, and uh, the, some of the really important early figures in eucalyptus taxonomy argued back and forth. We've got some pro and some con. So I think they were con, con, pro, pro. Uh, and then we also had um, uh, Pryor, Lindsay Pryor, who um, uh, has done, did a lot of work on a number of different groups, but when I saw this paper from 1953, it just blew me away because um, some of the work he did here was a really clear demonstration of, uh, of active hybridization in natural populations in eucalypts. So he looked at the morphology of seedlings of these two, two parents and then collected some seed from putative hybrids in the, in the wild and you could see the segregation of these, um, of these parental uh, leaf shapes in the offspring of those hybrids, which is really nice. Um, and before we get too excited, Hi uh, Pryor himself warned us not to be, get too carried away about saying that hybridization is absolutely everywhere and there are no reproductive barriers in eucalypts. Um, and this is what Rod Griffin and others uh, showed in a really important landmark um, uh, review of hybridization. Um, they looked at all the records of, of natural and artificial hybrids uh, that they could find. Um, and they actually found that of all of the possible hybrid, hybrid pairs um, that could be formed, that um, only about 15% had actually been observed. Um, so far from being you know, rampant, um, uh, highly promiscuous things, um, these species do actually seem to be real. Um, but one of the interesting things that came out of it was that the broadly distributed species were the ones that um, uh, showed more uh, evidence of hybridization. So there were more hybrids in those broadly distributed ones, and that's one of the observations that we used to design our study. Oops. And uh, I should also make a note of some of the important early molecular work in this area. Um, you'll notice some of these are, these are particularly Tasmanian um, papers. I didn't choose these just to pander. Um, so the Tasmanian groups did a lot of the very important um, uh, molecular work with uh, showing chloroplast variation um, across multiple species that showed um, shared haplotypes um, in particular areas of the, um, of the geographic ranges of those species. And um, in a really nice highlight, some of the mechanisms of asymmetric gene flow were shown clearly um, in these groups. We have um, two species, Eucalyptus globulus and Nitens. Um, they have very different flower sizes. And the growth of the pollen tubes um, actually makes a very nice barrier in one direction, but not in the other. So we've got, some, we've got a really nice body of, uh, of knowledge on which to start applying molecular uh, genomic tools in eucalypts. And uh, I just wanted to point out that since uh, eucalypt biologists have been studying hybridization, human biologists have been getting in on it too. Um, the adaptive introgression uh, is a really important topic in, uh, in human genetics these days also. Um, we know now that we have um, uh, portions of Neanderthal genomes uh, in us, and some populations have quite a lot of Denisovan DNA as well. So I'll get on to talking about our project. Um, we took advantage of uh, Adnoteria, which include a number of uh, species that are very closely related, uh, or relatively closely related among eucalypts, um, but they occur quite, they co-occur quite broadly. It's not uncommon to find populations or communities that have, um, a, you know, up to four or five um, species from this group all growing together. So there's lots of opportunity for hybridization here. 
and so with this project, we're aiming to ask whether interspecific hybridization has played a role in the diversification of this group, um, and what the evolutionary significance of introgression is, and whether co-occurring eucalypts are sharing adaptive alleles, and also, finally, whether we can actually resolve species within Adverteria in a satisfying way. So we picked 10 um, uh, species to focus on and sampled roughly range-wide. Um, and we covered four to five series, depending on the taxonomy, um, and aligned them to the, uh, to the eucalyptus reference genome. And uh, we used, sorry, that's after we used uh, NextEra to, uh, for whole genome sequencing. And just a little bit of information on this study group. Um, they're deployed, predominantly outcrossing, as we know. Um, and within uh, section Adnateria, there's actually about 14 series, and we've sampled a, a, a about half of them. Um, some of them have the box by, uh, bark type, and some of them have iron bark, but this isn't diagnostic of, of anything, really. Um, there's a lot of variation among species, and they have broadly co-occurring ranges. So this is a rough summary of the, of the sampling we did. As well as the, the 10 that we were aiming for, we, had, uh, we opportunistically sampled some related species that occurred with them. Um, and there is, we were expecting to, to find um, morphological variation that we couldn't um, put down to, uh, to the species taxonomy, and of course we did, particularly in this, um, in this Buxales group. And this is uh, no surprise because there's been some, uh, so some of the, the best work um, using molecular tools on, uh, on this group uh, has actually focused on, on the Buxales and found basically no resolution of the species using either chloroplast or ITS. Um, and there's some morphological uh, divergence, but, um, but, th but there's still quite a lot of overlap between them. Oh, I'm going to skip over that following Mike's lead. Uh, so we started with, uh, with a really uh, simple way into this data set um, by looking at chloroplast. So we did the same kind of chlor uh, chloroplast genome skimming approach that, um, that Mike talked about, about and, um, and did some, uh, built some trees of a subset of our samples, and then started to ask, well, where's our species tree? Actually, we found... Uh, some interesting things. So fortunately, our technical replicates um, are all clustered together, which is a really nice and reassuring. But if we looked at uh, the, the particular sister taxa that pop popped out in the tree, we found that, that there, there was very little resolution of species. And in fact, um, many of those sister taxa are even come from different series. So there's, there's not even uh, resolution at the series level um, in the chloroplast. So what can explain it? Uh, and again, I'm happy to... <laughs> to point to, to Mike Bailey's to, um, mention of the geographic patterns that are expected from hybridization. And this is essentially more of the same. It's, uh, so we've got a few more species involved, but we're still seeing, so this is our tree minus all the bootstraps. Uh, we're still seeing that, that, that we've, got, um, we've got closely related uh, chloroplasts coming from roughly the same region no matter what their, um, the, the, the species that they were, um, that they're associated with. Um, and so even, this is even within, within uh, sorry, across series, this um, green highlights just a few of the cases where you've got these little um, haplogroups that, um, that are very similar to one another but are, are, um, are really not from the same species. So this is really echoing um, what we know already from the, uh, from the, the Tasmanian work and, um, and the Victorian work on, um, on chloroplasts. So how does this um, shake out when we look at the, at the genomes? Now, this data set, it's a huge amount of data. We got about um, 850 terab terabases per run, um, but it's still only about eight to 10 uh, X when we align it to the, to the genome. So do we have high confidence in any of our genotypes? No, <laughs> we, are, we are pretty uncertain about most of our genotypes. So uh, there's been some interesting work that has found um, that if you look at the, the frequency, so the number of non-reference allele counts, um, which is, holds a lot of information that we can use for inferring population genetic parameters, um, if we have uncertainty, if we have low sampling um, of, our, of our genome, um, it can really strongly bias these uh, frequency spectra. 
So we have to use methods that can, um, that can avoid that. Um, so we use these techniques that overcome this kind of bias. The primary one that we use um, is in the angst package, uh, and that, that does limit some of the analyses that we can do downstream. But when we do this type of analysis, we do um, find some, some really nice, clear patterns that are very reassuring. <laughs> so for starters, the series are gener generally distinct in our ordinations. Um, we find uh, that, that the Meliodorae all group together and so on. The one exception is, um, is Rhodophyllin and Ciderofloyae. Um, so that's based on Brooker's taxonomy. I believe Dean puts them together. And so our, our uh, results are, are supporting that, um, that grouping quite nicely. It's a different matter when we think about the, when we look at the species. They're, uh, they're not always distinct from one another, um, particularly um, the, uh, the, the grey box group here. We had some, some samples that were, that were putative hybrids that we included. Um, one of them appears to be just not a hybrid at all. <laughs> um, and the other one uh, 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 seems to be potentially misidentified. But then there are other, other ones of interest that are, um, well, Kevin will talk more about that. <laughs> okay, so when we do, when we look at the, uh, at the FST, so the divergence between the species, um, we see that the between series mean is actually, that's actually quite a bit lower than many um, uh, species from other, from other groups. So we're seeing low divergence, not only between the species, but also at the series level. Um, compared to other groups of, of plants and animals. Um, and that speaks to what Jerry was saying about the, the amount of diversity that's held within those species. Uh, and our structure-like plot um, shows pretty good resolution um, of our focal species. Molokana, however, is, is an, an exception. So we've started to, um, to explore what might be driving the divergence between these species. And uh, one of the tools that we've used is an angst-based um, uh, estimate of the population branch statistic. This is a tool that, um, that uh, quantifies excessive allele frequency change that occurs after the divergence of sister species. And so what you do is you take two species and anchor them by a less closely related um, species. So in this case, um, for example, we have Eucalyptus conica and Eucalyptus polyanthemus, which are close relatives, they're within the same series, and Cytoroxalon um, is our outgroup for this purpose. And for neutral loci, we expect the divergence since, um, since they split to be roughly similar. But if we've got positive selection in the conica lineage, we expect this branch to be longer. There's some trickery involved in actually getting a, 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 a um, an estimate that makes sense. Um, I'm going to skip over that. <laughs> so um, here's some, uh, some windowed, oh no, these are not windowed, these are actually individual SNPs, um, across, the, across the genome for conica versus polyanthemus using cytoroxalin uh, as the outgroup. And you can see some, um, some pretty clear peaks that, um, that are uh, really suspicious and we're going to look into the, what those genes are and what else is in the region of them. If you compare that with Cytoroxalon versus Meliodora, which is also in the same series, um, and with Conica as the outgroup, you see quite a lot more peaks. They've probably been diverged for longer. They're more, they're, there are more morphological differences between them. So that makes sense. Uh, what's also reassuring about this is that we're not always seeing the same peaks occurring in, uh, in, in the different species, which, is, which would be of a concern if there were genome features um, that are really strongly biasing these, um, these estimates. But we do need to be careful about how we interpret these because this model assumes that there's no introgression from, from other species. <laughs> so what we're seeing here could actually be the result of introgression from, I don't know, uh, Prebra. <laughs> So this, this, is, this interpretation of positive selection is, uh, is really based on that strong assumption. So what evidence do we have of introgression? The tool we've used for this, and there are more sophisticated models that we're not able to use with our data yet because of the, um, the depth issue. Um, this is a, the Abababa, which is a nice, rolls off the tongue. The tongue. This is a, a test that, um, that is based on three 
um, three populations or three species. We've got them one, two, and three. And it compares the expectations of incomplete lineage sorting with, uh, with gene flow. So it looks for, in particular for informative sites. Those are the, the ones that have an ancestral allele and a derived allele that we know about. So um, if we have a gene tree that matches the species tree perfectly, we expect um, B and B to be in, the, in the, the, these two lineages and the ancestral allele to be here for an, in, for an informative site. Now, if we've got no interspecific gene flow, then we expect an approximately equal number of the two possible discordant trees. So here we've got a tree that has, um, that has uh, two and three as sister and a one and three as sister. And if you look at just the, the um, alleles that are present in each, of those, um, in each of those discordant trees, we get the ABBA pattern or the BABA pattern. We expect them to be balanced if there's no gene flow. But if there's introgression from uh, three, it's going to favour either ABBA or BABA. So we're gonna, if, if we've got introgression from three into two, we expect to see more trees that look like this than we do that look like this. And the difference between these is quantified as uh, the, the D statistic. Ooh, I missed the ding. Okay. So uh, the D statistic does show really strong patterns uh, in eucalyptus. We see that, um, we, we see that some, some moderate signals that make sense. And, um, but we also see that if we've got the species tree wrong, um, we, uh, we get wildly strong signals. But we can put all of this information together to identify the best supported admixture events um, across the whole tree. And this is probably only a few of the, of the real ones. We've got relatively poor fit here, so there's probably more that we can't detect with these data. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is that um, I've also been playing for, I don't know, about a year now with uh, trying to um, model historical demography using our site frequency spectra. And we end up with models that look like this, quantifying really important parameters like M1 and M2, um, the time since divergence. But I, wanted, I, I took this out and I put it back in because of what Rob mentioned about not knowing the mutation rate. Not only do we not know the mutation rate, we don't even know the generation time of eucalypts. So if anyone wants to get stuck into that, I'd be really interested in it. Okay, so um, uh, we've got strong signals of, of hybridization and integration. No surprises there. There's a lot more work to be done on trying to untangle the roles of, um, of the role of selection in driving this. And um, the landscape patterns are also really important. Have a look at Kevin's talk and two posters from my lab, Sam and Mamena. Thanks. <laughs> Um, in some cases, yes. Um, what we did for this study was to, um, to ignore those hybrid zones and really focus on, um, on individuals that we could nail down to a particular species. Um, but yeah, the, it's, it's actually not as, not as easy to find those, um, those active hybrid zones um, as you might think. Um, and my student, Mamena, is trying to test one of those um, cases. You'll see her poster. We do not know. Um, eucalypts, because we had no glaciation, um, well, not much glaciation on the mainland anyway, um, and so we, that, 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 that um, biogeographic history of that region is really um, difficult to untangle. Uh, <laughs> um, Margaret Byrne has done, um, has done a bit of work on comparing the eastern Australia and the western Australia, um, but it's really, it's really difficult to, to know. Thank you, Rose. And next up, um, you know, people sort of throw around the idea of chloroplasts being under selection or not. It's so <coughs> important to sequence the DNA in chloroplasts. And I think Jim and Tanya might have something to say about it. 
Yeah, just a couple of little points. I've got uh, 10 minutes, uh, so thanks everyone. Um, I, I suppose I'll just lead this off by um, making a point that you're probably obviously noticing already, or maybe you haven't, but uh, I'm talking about chloroplasts and I'm dressed in green. Now, it's not on purpose, all right? You know, you're rushing around, getting all your stuff together, you get up in the morning and you're green, and then you sit there, you go, I'm in green, chloroplast. Anyway, a coincidence, not on purpose. All right, so, um, sorry, I've got the list of people here. Um, so the work I'll present uh, was done by uh, Hossein, who's the first author there, and there's a few people out there in the audience today who are part of this project. Um, so I'll start off with the humble eucalypt leaf, all right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about love, all right? Okay, I know it's going to be a bit uncomfortable, but um, we can you know, be strong with our feelings. Who loves the eucalypt leaf? A few people there, here, yeah, here. Yeah. Have you got eucalypt leaves? Water prints at home? Who's got a water print at home? A few people, yes, a couple of people there. Um, who's got a, you know, a bouquet of eucalypt leaves in the hall? Yeah, got a couple of nods there. All right. uh, who showers with them? <laughs> Apparently it's good, yeah, okay, we've got Charles, yes, you didn't be one. All right, so shower me, okay, you get those eucalypt leaves, you know, clear the nose, all right. If you want to know the health benefits, go see Jules later on, all right, He'll, he's a proponent of it. All right, but, you know, they're remarkable things, leaves, these leaves, eucalypt leaves, you know, they can handle snow, they can handle sunshine, okay, and those temperatures, all right, so they've adapted across this wide range of conditions, okay, throughout, um, throughout Australia and into Indonesia and Papua, all right. However, if we look closely, and the question we're posing today, and we see these chloroplasts, here I'm depicting a chloroplast, um, we have that um, chloroplast genome. And we've got about 85 or so genes in there. And the question is, do, you know, does this genome hold a secret uh, to the eucalypt adaptive success? Okay, so that was the question posed at the start there. All right, so, um, so what do we do to try and start answering this question? Well, first of all, we analysed chloroplast genomes. So we had a look at those genomes and started to look for things like signatures of selection. Um, we undertook a functional study. So we started to think, you know, is this a functional thing, what we're seeing? And then lastly, we did some um, protein modelling just to confirm some of those observations, right? So I'm telling you all this stuff up front, um, and I'm giving you the take-home messages right at the beginning, and then I'll pa unpackage those for you. So uh, what did we find? We did find some evidence of uh, putative selection within some of these genes, okay, in, um, in chloroplast genomes, all right? And secondly, um, we sort of focused on a particular um, two, uh, sorry, not particular, but two um, polymorphisms in RBCL and did a functional study. And we did show some evidence there that suggests that, look, you know, they have a role in uh, photos enhancing photosynthetic assimilation rates. Okay, all right? So I'll try and unpackage that in those three studies in the next five or so minutes. All right, so putative signatures of selection. We started off with um, the 39 published. Uh, chloroplast genome uh, sequences from around the eucalypts, okay? So uh, we did the PAML analysis, so for those unfamiliar, it's a, basically just a, a look at the ratio of synonymous to non-synonymous mutations and then looking for signatures where that deviates either positive or, or negatively, okay? And that gives us an idea of whether there's a positive or, or negative selection going on. So when we looked across those 39 chloroplast genomes, we found about uh, 18 to 20 genes, depending on the analysis. Now, the package has a few different analyses. I'm not going to get into that detail in five minutes. However, it did pick up a few, okay? And these were around some of the photosynthetic and the genetic systems, okay? All right, so it's just the, the table there. Um, we also did sort of some branch analysis, so looking at um, so those phylogenetic relationships to see where some of these signatures were taking place or occurring. And um, we can see uh, in this table here that in Carimbia and Gophra, we didn't really see any of those signatures picked up in their chloroplast genomes. However, um, most of that took place in eucalyptus and some were specific to monocalyptus or eucalyptus or uh, the Cynthia Mertis. Okay, all right, so there's some specificities there uh, within those lineages. All right, now, interest specifically, now I am a phylogenetic session, so I have some phylogenetic stuff here. All right, just so that <laughs> could fit in. I'd, um, so we did, uh, we did, sequence 136 eucalyptus genome, uh, sorry, eucalyptus globulus chloroplast genomes, okay, across these seven populations you can see there. All right, so I'll touch on the, the uh, phylogenetic stuff here. We did notice um, the, the central and the southern chloroplast. However, we can see uh, a distinction here uh, between the, the west and the east in that central region, okay, with the sort of the, this being the area where it sort of radiated through into Tasmania and the east 
the central east sort of staying over to the east. All right, that sort of makes sense. Um, we then did the uh, panel analysis on those genes, so again, just those 85 genes. Uh, because of the low level of diversity uh, within these chloroplasts within the species, uh, we sort of had to concatenate those genes to pick up enough variation to be able to pick up those signals. Um, so then when we looked at that, at, the, at that species level within Eucalyptus globulus, we did find again about 23 genes, so a little bit more than with the intra study. Um, sorry, inter, not intra. Uh, and then we saw some genes that showed signatures of selection. Okay, all right. So there's a, a small table there of those that were really highly selected for, had strong signatures. So in summary, there were about four or so genes across both the inter and intra that showed those signatures of selection. Uh, among these, we had RBCL. Okay, so RBCL is the large subunit of Rubisco. All right, and there was in particular two sites uh, that had strong signatures across both data sets. So that was the uh, site 142, which is a, a, a tryptophan to proline, and then uh, 251 isoleucine to um, the thionine. Okay, and so when we looked at those signatures, we could sort of order these from the most selected for and the selected against. All right, so TI, TM, PI, and PM as haplotypes. Okay, across that gradient. All right. So we thought, well, let's have a look further. Let's see if there's a functional link with those. Okay, let's see if we can confirm some of these signatures. Um, so what we did, we, um, we collected some seeds from a couple of those populations. So these are where the haplotypes sort of sit uh, across the population. And we can see that there's about an even split between three of those haplotypes. So we didn't see the, the TI haplotypes, the one that was selected against mostly. Okay, that's not present at all in this set of 136. Uh, interestingly, it's only found in that 36, 39 inter um, Chloroplast genome sequence, there's only one of those um, species that has a TI. Okay, so it's pretty rare, the one that's selected against. Um, we've selected southern Tasmania uh, as our main sort of study because it had th all three haplotypes, and then we sort of had the Ferno group up here to support that. Um, 96 individuals were raised, and that was part of the study. 46 of those had the PMs, so that was the selected four. Um, and I didn't mention two either. Across all of the eucalypts, PM is only found in eucalyptus globulus. The one that's most selected for is only in eucalyptus globulus. Okay, that haplotype. So there's 42 PM, 40 TM, and 14 PI. Okay. We then um, used some of the gas exchange, the ERGA measurements, and we sort of, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that physiological stuff, but when you sort of have your um, CO2 concentration and assimilation rates there, if you control your CO2 concentration, you can um, sample at the Rubisco limiting step. Okay, so this is where Rubisco is limiting the reaction. And so it's a sort of in vivo measurement of um, the rate of Rubisco activity in, in the leaf. Okay, it's not a direct measurement. It's a, um, yeah, it's not a direct measurement. We also applied a temperature treatment to that. Okay, so over a period of five days, we increased five degrees, okay, because we thought there may be uh, something to do with temperature, okay. Um, so what we found, this is, the, uh, this is the data that we plotted from the assimilation rates here. So um, overall, we saw a decline with temperature, okay? So we see the temperature across the bottom here and the assimilation up here. Uh, when we looked at the site 142, um, where P has a higher uh, A than T, so assimilation higher than T across all those temperatures. So we've got the red and the green being those of the P, and then we've got the T being the blue. All right, and I'll just point this out. This is a glass house failure for a day. All right, so not ideal. You've got five days, you're doing an experiment, and the glass house fails on you. So uh, there is a bit of noise there, but generally you can see that, that pattern there. Um, for site 251, we can see... Um, oh, I've mixed those up, haven't I? There you go. It's my bad edit editing. Um, so anyway, the, the M here is... In, uh, in the blue and the red, uh, green, so that's the one that's selected for, and the I, the one that's selected against, is this one here. So we can see at 40 degrees that that declines much faster than M, all right? So we can see that at higher temperature, there's, you know, it, it's not as reacting as much to that higher temperature, all right? Okay, we've probably got about a minute left. So in summary, when we change the T to P, uh, we see overall assimilation rates increasing. Uh, when we have an I to an M, um, we see that that changes. We have a decline in that assimilation rate that's not as great. All right. So I thought, well, let's have a look at proteins. 
So I've only got one slide for this to try and get through that time. So we looked at um, Gibbs Free Energy. So for those who remember their Gibbs Free Energy from Biochemistry 101, the negative Gibbs Free Energy means the reaction moves forward. Okay. Um, if it's a positive Gibbs Free Energy, it means it needs energy for that reaction to go from products to reactants. Okay. So we look at those. There's my thing. Five minutes, I'm nearly there. Um, so when we look across our spectrum of P, M, P, I, T, M, T, I, so the most selected forward to the one that's being selected, for, the one selected for and the one selected against, uh, we can see the Gibbs free energy aligns perfectly with those. All right, so here we've got the highest energy needing for that reaction to move through and down here, our selected haplotype, we can see strongly that it has uh, a much more <coughs> Uh, energy efficient reaction. Okay, and when we think about those sites, they sort of sit. Here's the the P site here, the P to T, and we can see that that's sort of sitting inside the enzyme and probably has something to do with conformational stability. All right, and so that's part of you know it becomes a bit more rigid and it's able to, to work a little bit more efficiently. And perhaps the the methionine here, which sits between those subunits, okay, and holding those subunits together, may have a role in that thermostability or holding that protein together for a little bit longer when we get to those higher temperatures. All right, so we found evidence of putative selection. So we saw that across inter and intra um, uh, levels. Uh, we found an increase in that assimilation, okay, with those selected um, amino acids. We can see overall assimilation from the T to P and then the I to the M having less impact at higher temperatures and then some of the structural changes that the amino acid level are likely to have a role uh, in that in terms of making it more efficient and more thermostable. All right, so going back to where I started about the love of the eucalypts, so we're bringing back our love and hopefully now you've got another reason to love eucalypt leaves because they hold some secrets to some of the adaptive selection taking place out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, no, great question. The, uh, those two sites that we've got there, they come up in many other species. So it seems to be a really important site, not just in eucalypts, but more broadly um, around uh, photosynthesis and, and rubisco. Why don't they all? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, we can speculate. I mean, we can speculate about you know uh, if we go to the phylogenetic and stuff like that. If they, you know, the whether they have it or not, I, I'm not really. Well, it, it, we haven't really mapped it across those temperature climbs. Um, I mean, it's part of it's by chance by you know, the chloroplast being there. Um, yeah, it's a complex one. <laughs> Um, we did, yes, and yeah, um, and I, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I can't remember what we had on that. Yep, yep. But that was all measured, and we looked at stomatal conductance and a few other features there um, to validate that assimilation. 